Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning as we look to unpick the secrets to a successful sales process. This morning, I'm delighted to be joined by my good friend, uh, business coach and mentor, Phil Budd. Good morning, Phil. Morning. Those intros are getting better and better. So this morning, we're going to try and unpick uh, the secrets to that successful sales process. It's an area that we've been spending a lot of time on, both between us and also individually, and something I still don't think we've quite got right. So interested to hear your take on it, um, to see what other people think in the audience. Please, if you are joining us live, please do put your questions in and we will try and get around to them as soon as possible. But Phil, without further ado, let's get started. My first question is really to try and understand why businesses like ours and others that may be listening today stay away from or don't have an official sales process. Success is partly the challenge because a lot of successful businesses that I meet, and I think there's a lot that have gone through growth, uh, particularly if you're a, a marketing agency over the last 12 months, you've gone through no doubt some significant growth. Whatever sector you might be in construction, when you go through success and you achieve growth, it kind of comes natural without having to need a sales process. So I think for some, it's a case of, well, actually, what value does it bring? And I think the thing for me that I see constantly within businesses that I coach and that I talk to is that the sales process, if you get it right and have it documented and structured, drives consistency in your growth. And it's often when you get that inconsistency that businesses start to then challenge your thinking and saying, well, actually, what are we doing differently within the, within the marketing or the sales process? And inconsistent marketing can equally be part of the challenge. But sales process, documenting it, is the lowest cost way of driving better consistent sales in your business. And, and, and what I've got on the flip chart behind me just sets the scene as to what is a very simple sales process to consider that anybody can do within their business. And I just thought it might be worth just talking through everybody through this. So we've kind of got an idea of what the key steps are. And there's loads of variations to this. But the reason why I love this format is it's simple, right? So at the, tar at the front end, what we've got is we've got our target market. We're clear on who we're trying to market to and who we're trying to go after. And often on this, let me make an important point. People separate out marketing from sales. That It's changed. They're now really directly linked as processes. So you're going to see a little slight crossover here. But once you've identified your target market, it's about creating awareness. Oh, sorry, just on the target market side of things, how granular are you going into that kind of ICP, ideal customer profile? Um, how are you segmenting that audience? Is it just a demographic kind of job title um, business turnover size, how granular are you going? Well, the complexity here comes is if you've got multiple target markets, okay, so it's, it's, it's more than one. And that can be even more complicated if you've not niched down as a business. So if you haven't got a particular niche and basically you can appeal to anybody, you're going to have, it, you're going to have difficulty in identifying a target market. Let me maybe change it. So we're talking about two things here. Target market in terms of the demographic profile of the type of business or individual that fits your products or service that you want to sell. But there's also a slight variation on that that I would add, which is your ideal customer. Because sometimes who you're targeting at the moment maybe isn't your ideal customer. So what we're looking at here is a profile of a business based on turnover, size, um, values. I think one of the things we don't often think about is in terms of our target market and our ideal customer, what the values of the organization is. Why would we want to work with people that don't share the same values as us? And sometimes when we're chasing growth, we pretty much will take anybody. Okay, let's be open about it. But actually, if you want a sustainable business and the right type of customers, something that's coming more and more to the fore that I'm seeing within, within the market is actually having someone or a business individual that shares some of the values. So we've got so, to sorry, about just on the values, how do we understand a business? So we're going through some prospecting at the moment. We're looking at our ICP. We're saying, okay, they're going to hit this turnover size. They're going to be in this sector. They're going to probably have this job title. This is what we're going to put in front of them. We'll come to that shortly. The question with the values, though, I really like that point. But how do we find out a business's values without necessarily having spoken to them? So there's some great opportunity. You can do it. Social media is a great opportunity to delve deep into a business's culture. Um, looking at what are they posting about? What are their staff posting about? Do their staff seem engaged with the posts that are on social media? Net promoter score. What's their testimonials like on their website? Do they take positive and negative feedback well? How do the, how do the founders or the CEOs respond 
to maybe negative comments about the business on social media. So I think all of these things can give us a pretty good insight into a business based on the founder's values, but also that other staff in terms of the culture that they have within the business. Social media has made it more open than ever before. Perfect. Okay, so going away from target market and starting at that awareness stage, tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so awareness is really then driven through the the consistent way in which we're we're marketing to individuals who fall within that target market. And once we've created that level of awareness, what we can then do is go into the consideration trace phase. But the one thing that I would say around this that that I think is sometimes underestimated is the importance of building trust within the marketing process. Often the way that we treat sales is very transactional. We send a direct marketing piece, we then expect a meeting. Whereas that awareness piece, in terms of building that trust and rapport, particularly within the marketing stage, that can take a lot of effort and over, over several months. Now, once we've got into that stage where they're aware of what we're doing, then we're in a situation where actually they're maybe prepared to consider what we do. Now, that could be a trigger point from a direct marketing piece that we've done, maybe a, a DM campaign, maybe it's a direct message, whatever it might be. But we get into that point where someone says, do you know what? I'm willing to have a conversation with you. And Phil, I guess that's a frustration for many business owners is that they want to skip those steps because sometimes they haven't got the patience or the time to wait to go through and nurture people along that funnel. So they just go straight for the jugular and for the sell. And actually, they haven't warmed up the prospect enough and therefore they're not ready. Absolutely. And I think that that's the challenge with how a lot of sales processes have changed is nowadays we're as a, as a society, we're much more transactional in a sense. We're, you know, through the way that we can order online, it's very quick. We kind of bypass a lot of the steps. Now, if, there's some variation to what I'm talking about here because we're talking about here really B2B sales. B2C is slightly different because of online platforms and all the rest of it. But if we're in B2B sales, in a way, sometimes slowing the sales process down to build the right depth to the relationship is more important than simply getting the sale. I mean, how many of you probably listening today have been in a situation where they've had someone with loads of buying needs, really want to buy, rush them through the sales process because they've got a great deal. And then suddenly when they've got that customer on board, find the customer really hard work or the customer then gets buyer's re remorse because actually we haven't gone through the due diligence within the sales process. So I think this is, if you get this right, what this absolutely nails on is having good relationships with clients and the right kind of relationships to build a great service and build what that later stage is, great loyalty. So we want the right customers on, but for a long period of time as well. So when we're talking about getting into this consideration phase, it's considering, okay, how, how, do, we, how do we build up into layers so this trust is building and building and building? We're building great levels of rapport. And I'll give you a couple of really brief things around this. The speed in which we respond to an inquiry. And I imagine we've all had this personally. We get interested in a particular product or service. We message a tradesperson, or if by way of example, they take two weeks to come back to us. There's some real simple things here that we can do that build that trust and, uh, and confidence in what we do by simply being good and, and efficient at what we do and how we respond. So the speed of response is equally important. So just and a challenge on, on that one. What happens in a business if the sales person, okay, they, they buy into that philosophy, they're super quick at response, but it sets unnecessary expectations for as the client goes through that business and goes away from the salesperson and into the day-to-day -day operations where suddenly their response is perhaps not responded to within 24 hours or whatever, because that's not how the business can operate. Yeah. I think that we'll get into that a little bit around the sales process of, of managing clients' expectations, but a quick response for me in today's environment is what people want to respond to. How we then manage their expectations around that responsiveness moving forward is down to really good communication from the salesperson's perspective. So it's saying, okay, once we get into consideration stage and they're aware of what we do and we want to start having a conversation, how clear are we on identifying that client's needs or that potential client's needs? You know, are we um, sensing they just want to get to the price point very quickly or are we, are we establishing what we feel are being a, a clear need? Because for me, there's a difference between a vague need and a clear need. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail as well. So once we kind of get into that stage of them considering what, what we offer, maybe there's a proposal stage within that. Like I'm highlighting here, there's multiple stages within each stage. We then get into the purchase stage, which is when they're ready to buy. 
And people underestimate, again, the sales process hasn't finished at the point of purchase. How many salespeople have we come across over the years where they get the deal and then walk away and we never hear from them again, right? Post-purchase selling is really important. Well, when I say selling, more post-purchase communication from the salesperson. Then we get into service stage where we're servicing the client and we're delivering what we've said. And then we start getting into loyalty. But what happens with most salespeople, they simply focus on this middle stage. They build a proposal, get the interest from the potential client, the client buys, salesperson walks away. And what we're highlighting here through the blue and red bullet points is the importance of physical and digital touch points. And this is another point I just want to briefly highlight to everybody today listening that there's some great automation out there that you can build with CRMs. I have them within my own business. The physical touch points are so powerful. And I learned this from a top sales trainer years ago. This is really powerful within when you're in the sales process. Say you're not yet at purchase, but they're considering what, what, what you're offering. And you send them a very brief email and it starts with this. I saw this and thought of you. Now, it could be a link to an article. It could be to do with something they're doing around recruitment. Maybe um, something's going on with another form of service that they mention to you that you can't directly operate on or offer. But how powerful it is when we create physical or digital touch points that are within the sales process, but are more focused on building the rapport and trust. What does it show to a potential client when we send them an email or we pick up the phone and say, Nathan, I saw this article and I thought of you because it's relevant to such and such. So just a question on that. What's the difference between a physical touch point and a digital touch point? Yeah, so some people would say that an email, for instance, would be a, a physical touch point. For me, that I would still class that in the digital uh, criteria. So digital is like a social media like on their on their on one of their posts, an interaction online, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it might be. Um, I would put email into that as well. Maybe we've sent them through a white paper or some supporting documentation within the sales process. A physical touch point is where we have that physical interaction. And albeit that's changed a little bit with COVID, right? So that would be, in my mind, it would be a telephone call. It would be uh, a WhatsApp uh, voice message. It could be uh, a online meeting, but still physical, albeit we may be not face-to-face. -face. Or if we can now do face-to-face -face meetings, a face-to-face -face meeting. It's a way in which we can get that emotion across. The way I describe a physical touch point, it's a way of us getting that emotion across and that interaction that we just can't get across in digital forms. Now, don't just go on my definition of that. If you want to define them slightly different, that's fine. What we're trying to convey is just because we have lots of touch points with email and other forms of communication, don't underestimate the physical touch points. It's those small physical touch points that can really build the emotion and trust within the relationship. So then we've got the final stage when we're servicing the client, just go back over, and then we get into this loyalty stage. So we've rattled through that really quickly. And if anybody watching today wants a, a one pager on this to, to look at within their own business, I'm welcome. I'm happy to provide that um, as a PDF attachment within, within the LinkedIn feed. But that's the overall sales process. So, Phil, question there. In terms of the service and loyalty sections, what role does the salesperson have in those areas where perhaps they've sent it over to the ops team? They're now delivering said product or service. Uh, maybe a car situation. So the sales guy sold you the car. Actually, you've now got the car. However, are you suggesting that the salesperson is just touching base periodically to say how it's going, how they're finding it? Is there anything further they can help with or any support they need? It depends on your values and what you want to be known for as a salesperson. Let me give you that example. Let me give you an example that you've given there of a car salesperson. How cool would this be, right? If you were the client and three months after your purchase, you got a call from the salesperson and said, wanted to give you a call as I know one of the reasons for buying the car is you're planning a trip down to France in, uh, in, 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 in the summer. Just wanted to see how your prep's going for that. And I wanted to send you something, a little something in the post ahead of your trip down to France. And maybe if they've got kids, maybe it's a Lego pack or whatever it might be. Right? How cool would that be? What would, what would you be thinking as a client? What would you be thinking, Nathan? Yeah, well, uh, it's interesting you say the Lego pack example because I heard from one of your clients just last week about how you sent them a Lego pack and they were bowled over by it. So <laughs> a Lego pack is a perfect example. But no, if that was me, I'd just think, yeah, they, they really do care. They understand me and I'd feel like I had far more than a commercial relationship with that individual. There was something far deeper to it. And I'd certainly be not only telling other people, 
but probably going back when I'm due to make the repeat purchase back to that person to continue that relationship. Absolutely. And I think that the way that we communicate and the way that we handle the sales process for me is what represents our values about us as a person. You know, are we about just getting the sale? Are we another salesperson? Or actually, are we the type of person that wants to build deep, meaningful relationships with our clients? Now, if you've got hundreds of clients, we've got to be realistic about this. Maybe that's not possible in every case. But if we're in B2B sales and we're dealing with high value sales, maybe there's people watching today that are an age, a fellow agency owner. You know, why not do these things that just separate us and make us look a little bit different? Because when you build the level of trust and rapport that we're talking about through a good sales process, I promise you this. When you have an issue with that client, you've deposited in that emotional bank account with that client to build the trust and rapport. Therefore, they will pay that back. They absolutely will. But often the reason why we get disgruntled clients or we get issues with clients, particularly when we get into the service stage, is because we don't have the depth of relationship and trust where we can have a really good conversation about the issues. And I, I firmly believe that if you've got the depth to it, relationships with clients can become stronger, even if you do have issues, because you're talking in a way that is much, much deeper than a superficial transaction arrangement. It's a really interesting one, actually, going back to that car example, I just got a a different car recently and uh the service piece just when we got to that stage and you bought the car and everything else a few challenges with the car the the salesperson the ops team or mechanics whatever it is there seems to be a real disconnect between those two and so the way i was spoken to or dealt with by the salesperson versus the way i'm spoken to dealt with and prioritized by the service team is massively different and yes you're right there is goodwill bought up however that quickly runs thin if there's no consistency between all the departments yeah, and, and here's another example of the building on that. Are we focused on gaining sales? Are we focused on building relationships? Uh, my business, I appreciate, is slightly different because I run a coaching business, but I'll give you a very brief example. Years ago, I did an event, and there was a business there that was going through some good growth, and I just sent them a postcard. And I said, look, just fantastic to hear about your story, wishing you all the best for the next year, and um, hope all everything you're doing continues. Wasn't trying to sell them coaching, wasn't trying to have a discussion about coaching, nothing like that just a rapport piece. They kept that postcard on their fridge for 18 months and then they got in contact with me at a later point and said, we want to have a conversation. Now, I'm choosing that, that that might be a one-off, but that highlights that if we're focused on simply building relationships and rapport, we make a much bigger impact than purely trying to go for the sale. And I think often with salespeople, we're so, we've got quotas to hit and targets to hit that actually we get obsessed by trying to close the deal rather than following the process that allows us to close the deal. And Phil, what do you say to those people that, okay, they do take the relationship um, angle and they focus on relationships rather than just sales, yet they do have quotas and there's others in their business, again, maybe away from, maybe an estate agency business. That person's got targets they need to hit, yet actually they're focused on building rapport and relationship and everything else. In something like that, it's quite a fast-moving industry. If they don't sell it, someone else might or whatever – how do you make sure you don't, uh, again, if you're not so heavily involved in sales, perhaps you look at it and think, well, blimey, they're not hitting their sales quota. They're not a good salesperson, but perhaps they are. They're just doing things ethically and properly. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and look, sometimes that can happen where you could have a really good communicator that maybe focus on the right things, but doesn't get the sales. I get that. It's a good challenge back. The thing that I would say is that if you are driving the right level of activity, in trying to build the relationships and you do this consistent, consistently, it will pay you back in time. Short-term thinking is partly what makes people bypass good sales processes and good marketing, right? And you must see this all the time within your business. People want to bypass the marketing. They want to just get the result and therefore shortcut certain things. In long-term, you just can't do that. So sometimes within businesses, maybe it's about slowing down the sales that are coming through to make sure you drive the consistency within the sales process, but it will come back. And that's why I would say that most people don't have good systems and processes in place in their business, because it's very easy just to firefight and fix the issue, not deal with the long-term challenge of driving consistency and high standards within the business. Now, the other point I wanna make on this is, is particularly when we're in the sales process, I'll just share my screen on this, if that's okay, um, Nathan. Yeah. Just let me know when it's there and I'll add it in. Perfect. So this is this is something that I got taught many years ago, but one of my first sales jobs, which is the difference between vague needs and clear needs. 
So there's an example on here, which is prospect says, I need to improve service levels. Okay. And, and what the salesperson can do, SP stands for salesperson, by the way, P stands for prospect. So this is an example how we turn a vague need into a clear need. So this is about getting clarity on the consequence and the emotional impact of the need that they've just said. So the salesperson then can say, look, tell me some more about that. What is it about the current service levels that isn't meeting your expectations? In an ideal situation, what would you like to see? What is the impact if you don't change? And here's some other things. To ensure I have understood correctly, let me now summarize back what you've said to me. Because what a lot of sales per people do is they take that vague need, which is from a prospect of saying, I need to improve service levels and say, brilliant, great. Well, at quick fire, we can help you with that. This is exactly how we can deal with it. Interesting. So they jump into solution mode and say, this is what you need. This is how much it's going to cost. And let's wrap it all up as opposed to really digging down into the problem. Absolutely. So if I stop sharing for a second. So, yeah, that's exactly what happens. So we, we kind of get into that sales mode. Brilliant. I've got a buying signal. Someone says they need a help. But what we haven't done is we haven't built the emotional attachment to that need. And we haven't dug deeper to understand why someone needs to change. I remember years ago, I, I did this with a prospect I was working on. And I failed at this, right? This was my learning curve. It stuck with me ever since. Um, I was in a sales job where we were selling a, a, a service. And um, the prospect said, we need to save money each year. And I was like, brilliant. The service that I provide can save you loads of money. Let me build your proposal. Built a proposal. You had X amount of savings. Prospect turned around and said, Phil, thanks for all your effort with the proposal. We're going to look at it in 18 months time because what we're looking for is savings over a minimum value. And what I had done, I thought I could save them a load of money, but that was in my mind, not in their mind. And this is a danger that salespeople always fall into. We take a small bit of information, we see it as a buying signal and we jump and we try then offer to sell, sell the solution instead of asking more questions to dig deeper into what that need is so we can quantify what they're doing it's talking about, but also build the emotional attachment so they see the need to change. You know, how many of us have ever put a proposal together or worked with a prospect and we thought we've got something really great and they come back to us and say, well, I'm going to put it on hold for a few months. And we're thinking, well, what's going on there? You know, you said you really want to change. You want to do something about it. We haven't taken that vague need and we haven't turned it into a clear need. So this is a really great, simple one page document that you could produce in your business that will help you take what we've highlighted so far around the sales process, but most importantly, turn vague needs into clear needs. And there's a few things here that I just think is worth highlighting to people that will really transform your sales. I promise you this, if you did this, you'll absolutely have a positive impact on your conversion rate. I'm just going to go through the sections. I've helped produce this with other businesses for their own businesses, okay? So we've got at the top part, top, top part a positioning and strong opening statement. And I'll go through this in more detail. We then get got questions that dig deeper. We've got a section which is about the needs of the client. We've got a section on the close. And we've got next steps. Now, this, for me, is where most sales go wrong. It's in the positioning and opening statement of when you first pick up the phone to a prospect. So this is the scenario where someone says, I've been on your website. I've seen what you do. I'm interested in having a conversation. People do not position the sale. And this is about a few things, just to give you a few tips around this. This is about understanding how they've heard about you, why they got in contact, but then explaining the sales process. You know, how many of us have all been through that situation, and me included years ago, where we get an inquiry and say, great, well, it'd be great to tell you a little bit about what we do. Yeah, we do this. We work with so-and-so clients. We've had great success. You know, this is what we're looking at as a rough price range to do what we need to do. And at the end of the call, the individual chairman said, well, it's given me enough information. Thanks. I'll come back to you if I need you. And that's because we don't position the sale. So what we mean by positioning the sale is explaining to them the process that we need to go through in order for them to make a decision about using our services. Let me give an example from, from your perspective, Nathan, kind of related to, to your business. So it'd be a case of me saying, Nathan, thanks for uh, ringing Quickfire today. Can I first of all understand, it'd be great to understand how you heard about us and what, what sort of made you get in contact? That would be my first question. Then I'd say, great, well, just to explain a little bit how the process works for any new inquiry we have come through at um, Quickfire, because we value relationships with our clients and building long-term relationships. 
the process is that today I'll ask you a few questions about what you're interested in, what you're looking to achieve um, by changing your, your website. Um, you can ask me some questions about uh, what we do. And if at the end of today's conversation, we feel there's value in moving this conversation further forward, the next stage would be to do a full and needs analysis of what you're doing so we can then build a proposal and for you to make a decision. Does that sound fair to you, Nathan? Now, what we've done is we've positioned the steps that we're going to go through. We're going to ask them some questions. They're going to ask us some questions. We're then going to establish whether there's some common ground. And then for the next step, is to then go to a proposal stage or do a full-blown needs analysis. That's the next step. So when we become come to the close, we've already positioned the close. So then when we get to the end of the conversation, we can say, Nathan, I said to you at the start that if we both felt there's value in moving this conversation forward, the next stage would be to do uh, a full-blown needs analysis. From my perspective, I, I think that we, we warrant that. What's your thoughts? Does that sound right to you? And so what we've done is we, we're not hard selling them into a close. We're bringing them along in the process. And actually, that's perfectly reasonable to close them because we've positioned it at the start. I'm just uh, thinking back to all the recent conversations I've been having. And I think there is a um, partly guilt on my side, actually, of sometimes rushing through that process where you just say, OK, like you say, jump into solution. Oh, you need this. Yeah, you're going to need that. You're going to need that. You're going to need that. Most people will tell you about this and this. Make sure you consider this. You kind of give them too much value. And that's something I do want to touch upon is in the sales process, how do you find that balance between giving them too much value versus not giving them enough? Don't give them any value. Just, just listen to them and ask good questions because that's what most salespeople don't do. They, they go into solution mode. They go into thinking, I've got to add value to this conversation. I've got to give them insights. Most customers... And I don't mean this in a, uh, uh, in a in a patronizing way. So please, those watching, don't take it this way. But most of us, when we're buying a product, don't know what we want. Most of us don't know what we want. When we go into a clothing store or we're around the supermarket, okay, some of us might have a bit of an idea. But it's amazing how we how how buying um, habits can be shaped based on the salesperson. So if a salesperson asks good questions you are going to build so much more rapport than simply singing your praises about what you can do as a business. So if you dig deeper and ask better questions and help the client get clarity on what they need, what does that say about your values as a salesperson, as a business? What are you saying to that buying, that business that's buying? Are you going to sound different to any other agency or any other business out there by simply taking the time to understand what they're after? And there's a few questions around this that are really powerful. When we're talking about digging deeper questions, it's used in coaching as well, right? But it's a great new thing to use within the sales process. Tell me some more about that. So a client says, um, a prospect, I should say, says, do you know what? We're struggling with our current agency that we're using. Tell me some more. Simplest, the most simplest question to get them to expand upon what they're thinking. Now, within that, we build emotion within them, which was going back to the difference between vague needs and clear needs, to understand what is it the pain they're going through. Okay, so what 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 would you in an ideal situation like to change? Okay, what would be the impact on that if you were able to bring about that? Have you got an idea of what that solution looks like in your mind? We're not telling; we're asking questions. Most salespeople tell. It's mostly hard sell. We're pushing the client into a decision rather than bringing, us, bringing them with us into the right decision from them. Um, and this is really what I'm describing in the main, what I describe as traditional consultative selling. It's a different kind of sales process. We're consulting with them. And do you know what? By that, we're adding value because we're getting them the clarity that they need on what they want to buy. It's interesting, Phil, because one thing that just sprung to mind is a big challenge we've had in our business in particular is the ability for owner founders to not be the only ones that can do the selling. Now, of course, by taking this approach, you are asking questions and they've got to be educated questions, of course. But at the same time, it stops you having to have bundles and bundles of knowledge, in our case, in the world of e-commerce to be able to make a sale. It's just an ability to listen and build rapport that you need, not that you need to know the ins and outs of the Shopify ecosystem and how it works, etc., to be able to make that sale. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So let's just challenge that and understand it. Why do most uh, businesses want to deal with a fellow founder 
or agency owner. Why? They think it's a decision making thing and they want to talk to the decision maker or want to feel like they're uh, important or being heard. Yeah. So let's focus on that last bit, which I think is one of the key elements you've said. They want to feel heard. If they potentially deal with what they feel like is a more junior member of staff, they think that maybe they're going to get sold to. They want to operate on a level where they could have a really good conversation. You know, doesn't matter how old you are or how much experience you have in sales. Anybody can deliver the uh, de develop the ability to ask good questions. They really can. And and I, I I've coached and developed a lot of sales teams over the years, and being present and just asking really good questions you demonstrate so much value to the prospect. It just changes the relationship. And I remember years ago, there was an instance where, again, I was working on an opportunity and we established that we weren't the right business to help them. And I said to the client, look, I've, I've listened to your needs and I just, I, I, I don't think we're the right fit. And let me explain why. I'd love to work with you because from a values perspective and the, the relationship, but I don't think we're the right fit. But I can recommend a few other people. At the end of that conversation, they said to them, okay, there's two other projects, Phil, that I wasn't going to raise with you, but I do want to raise with you now because I want to work with you as well. Could we look at these two, two other projects? Now, would they have given me that opportunity if I hadn't have been open with them about that I can't fulfill that first project? I wonder. But because the values was there and we were aligned, rather than it being a salesperson, a prospect, we in effect moved around the same side of the table and said, we want to work with each other. What opportunities can we work with each other on? Yeah, interesting. Phil, in terms of the, the process, one pushback I've always had is around the personalization or personality that seems to possibly be sucked out by replacing it with automation or process. So you can't be Nathan, if you like, if you're going through hoop after hoop after hoop, not only because that's not how I like to work or, or kind of work my best, versus actually when you're trying to scale a business the whole argument is always trying to get nathan to do less of the sales so how do you go on this journey without losing the personality that for many years is what's made you who you are and what's got you this far yeah so this within the sales process something that i'm always keen on is having a sales guide and structure but not a script and i think that it's when we bring scripts into play that we lose our personality. How many of us have experienced that with call center type sales from large multinationals where you can just tell they're reading a script? There's no relationship. There's no substance to it. It's just a process that's been, that you're going through. And that's why I personally lean towards this kind of structure where we've got an idea of how we're going to open the sale. We've got an idea how we're going to close it. But the bit in the middle comes down to good, effective questions. You know, so... The sales process drives consistency based on how we position and close it, but actually what their needs are, well, this is, come, this is where the skill comes in. And I firmly believe that sales is a skill. I, I, I never believe it. When people say to me, you're a natural born salesperson or you're not, I don't, I don't, I don't buy into that. You know, nature versus nurture. You can, you can become a good salesperson if you've got the right attitude and you can build relationships with people. And in fact, you can learn to build relationships with people. Again, that's a skill again you can learn. So I think that your point about allowing your personality to come through is, is really important. People do buy people and some people won't respond well to that personality, even if they're following the same script, but that's okay because we all buy from different individuals. That leads us on to the next question for around personality types. And when we're selling, we used to use a great tool called crystal nose um, where you could just understand a bit about that person before you jumped on a call with them. Interested to hear from your side Yes, okay, the bit in the middle, the questions are, are going to be different. However, the start and the stop, uh, the start and the end are going to be similar or consistent. Yep. Do you ever have to totally rip up the script if you're going in to a room where I know you've done a lot of personality profiling and maybe they're a high D or a high I or whatever? Does that whole model shift and change based on the personality type to which you're selling to? Yes. So if you're dealing with uh, a CEO, let's describe by function process because people find that more related than relatable than maybe behavioral styles so if we take someone like a ceo um a real senior person with a large business because of the nature of the role they're going to be very results orientated and, and and very direct in their communication in most instances okay without making it too standard across the board so the way we communicate has to adapt so 
if, for instance, I've got a great deck, a slide deck put together of my agency that's 30 slides long and I want to show some customer testimonials and videos and all sorts, if I turn up and there are, there are, there are a dominant individual like that, like a high deers we describe from a disrespective in that role, I need to vary my approach. I, I, I would not even get, even get that out of my bag. I wouldn't even show them. I'll just sit there, ask good questions, direct questions, some closed questions as well as open, you know, because you want to get to the point pretty quickly. And in instances like that, particularly where I'm dealing with a CEO, I will start the meeting and I'll say, Nathan, I'm grateful you see me today. And there's things that I'd like to discuss with you. But most importantly, what do you want to get out of today's session? Now, what that does with someone who is in a senior position, it cuts through it. Now, if I sit there and say, Nathan, um, I've produced a really nice 20-minute um, presentation today. How's your, how's your cat and dog doing? How's your goldfish? You know, and I'm getting into all this sort of information, right, about background information. I'm not saying those questions are wrong in, in, in certain situations, but if you're dealing with a senior person that's very direct, you will wind them up. So there's an example there. If you're dealing with an FD, what's there going to be their focus? They're maybe going to be quite a, a numbers-driven person detail orientated so again if we don't come prepped in that scenario with maybe some detail and analysis around how we can help them that again could be our fall down so this is where the adaptability comes in if we're dealing with a marketing person marketing person could be numbers focused but actually they could be quite creative if we're too detail orientated and too direct that's going to switch them off so the challenge comes in and the skill comes in by making sure that we're adapting to those different styles. You've got to be aware of that. You've got to be aware of your own communication style and adapt accordingly. My style is naturally very direct um, and I get to the point quickly. I've had to work on that over the years. So if I'm dealing with someone that's more measured, takes time to make decisions, you can't close them quickly. You've got to take longer within that process. Maybe those individuals are going to need three or four meetings, not just the one when you're dealing with the CEO or founder. Yeah, interesting. So in terms of hiring the salesperson, is there a particular disc profile or type that you look for when you're looking for what makes that right salesperson? Or actually, like you say, it can be trained into anyone. And, and sometimes there's different strengths and weaknesses that can soon be learned. Yeah. So there's a few things on this. Let's, let's, let's list these. OK, so when I'm looking at recruiting a salesperson, these are the things that really matter to me. Most importantly, values. Most importantly are values. You know, so I'm not necessarily looking for someone that's hit massive quotas before. What I'm looking for is a sense of values of that as, as a person. This is about understanding their background, you know, a little bit about them as a person, how they've handled certain situations. And often with salespeople, we want people that have had success. Do you know what? Some of the best salespeople I've ever worked with are the ones that have had peaks and troughs with success and failure. Because actually, when you make mistakes, you learn. And this leads on to something else that's really important to me. Are they a sponge? You cannot develop a sales individual if they're a rock. This is a Clive Woodward principle that he used when he was building his, his World Cup rugby team. Are they a rock or a sponge? You can have a high performer that fundamentally will not take on any new learnings. Are they going to be a great team member within your business from a cultural perspective? Are they the type of individuals that are wanting to learn, wanting to develop, take on feedback? I want sponges in my team. I want people that are want, okay, they may be not as high a performer as another person, but are they going to develop? Are they going to take on feedback? You can't do anything with rocks. And that's an interesting question that I always pose to, to business owners, which is if you've got a high performer in your team, they're very successful, but they don't fit within the culture of your business. What do you do about that? Because I tell you now from a sports perspective is if you've got individuals like that, I'm thinking the crick cricketer, actually, Kevin Peterson's a great example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a great example, right, in a way, without being overly critical of him, but great talent, phenomenal cricketer, right, but completely disruptive to the culture of the team. What's more important, values and culture or, or ability, particularly when you're involved in a team sport? It's interesting, just looking at the Manchester United example at the moment as well. And I mean, a, an amazing team of individuals built on millions and millions of pounds. But actually, in terms of gelling as a team and supporting each other, it doesn't seem to be there. So, as you say, I think a team full of sponges, uh, I guess, Phil, the challenge would be, 
could someone argue that a team full of sponges has no leaders? And so someone like Kevin Peterson, I would argue that, and this is just my opinion, but in every team there's room for someone like Kevin Peterson who has a bit of flair about them and is a bit more spontaneous and is a match winner. You can have match winners at sponges. I appreciate that. But sometimes there is a place for a rock. Oh, good challenge. It de depends on what your view of what leadership is. My views on leadership have changed massively over the years. Is a leader the type of person that is that outgoing character that slaps everybody on the back and gets them going and gets them motivated, the loudest in the team? Or is the leader the quietest and the most humblest person within the room? Depends on what your view as leadership is. You see, some well, of the best leaders... I guess it might be the ability to have a hybrid of both because sometimes there isn't a place for a Wolf of Wall Street style character that's slapping people on the back and trying to G everyone up versus sometimes that's exactly what you need if the morale is down and and you need the team to perform. Sometimes you might need a little pep talk or someone to give you that buzz to really make you remember why you're coming to work, etc. Yeah, so that then leads on to the third point when you're looking at recruitment, which is the overall team. Because the other consideration um, people don't give when they're recruiting a salesperson is how does this fit within the dynamic of the team? Take the All Blacks rugby team as a, as a great example of this. Culturally, they are such a tight team. They work for the team. In line with your point, have they got different characters in there? Absolutely. So the point here is that, that it's not about having one fit for what a salesperson should look like within your team. It's looking at the overall dynamic of the team and saying, actually, what do we need to get that balance right? If you had a team that was full of just kind of those strong individuals, very dominant styles, that potentially could cause challenge. Equally, if you've only got certain behavioural styles within one team and a more dominant side of another, that again will cause challenge. The balance is really important. I wonder if you did an analysis of winners. I mean, we stick to the sporting analogy. Serial winners, whether it be your Roger Federer's or your Tiger Woods or, um, yeah, the Emma Raducanu and her recent success. Like anyone, it's successful uh, singers, uh, movie stars, etc., I wonder if more of them are sponges or more of them are rocks. Ah, okay, brilliant. Um, oh, what's the name of the outgoing uh, tennis player? Uh, Nick. Uh, oh, Nick Kyriakos or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Let's use example, right? So he won't have a coach. He won't have a coach. And the reason why he won't have a coach is because he doesn't feel they can add any value. Now, here's an example of a great guy with great talent never really succeeded and achieved the high levels of Nadal or Federer. Now, I just wonder if he was more sponge-like, like those top co like those top players that have multiple coaches, could he achieve his true potential? But what's he fearful of by not having a coach? And that's interesting, isn't it? When you look at those that are high performers, what I would say in most instances, very rarely is it the case nowadays, most of them now have a number of coaches. Sports psychology is massive now within rugby and a lot of top sports. They see the need for outside perspective. They see the need to drive high performance and improvement and ability. Phil, question here around sponge versus rock and being able to make your own decisions. I guess there is an argument to say some people, you've got to have some kind of talent there before you can be a sponge. Otherwise, you're just purely taking outside opinion, never making your own decisions. And if we pull this back to a business sense, sometimes being or trying to be a sponge style character taking on too many external outputs can become just as conflicting or difficult to manage than having no coach at all so you've got one coach telling you one thing another coach telling you another sometimes three or four coaches and some of the information is conflicting and one's telling you to look after yourself and one's telling you to lay it all on the line and grow the business how do you stop being such a sponge that you forget actually that while all this information is hugely valuable at the end of the day, you're the person that's got to deliver it. Crikey, there's a lot in that question. I'm trying to think where to start. So I talk from personal experience on this. So I have a coach. I have two coaches, in fact. And those coaches are aligned to my values. They're aligned to my values. I think that's an important point based on what you just said there, that if you're getting conflicting information from a lot of outside different sources, mentors and coaches, You've got to get a sense of actually where your values sit and be clear on those is about actually who's aligned to that. Okay, so that's the, that's the first point based on what you've picked up on. 
The other thing that, that you mentioned there about is that you've got to have some degree of talent in order to be successful and, and develop them sponge-like in order to develop them into their full potential. I don't necessarily buy into that 100%. And let me explain why. Is that Years ago, I developed a sales team that had no sales experience. We took graduates on fresh out of uni with no sales experience. Never done sales at all. Now, what we were looking for, those is the potential within them to develop them. Now, can you, if you're a big organization, have loads of individuals like that? Probably not, because that is a long-term investment. You do need to balance that with having some talent coming in that already have it. But yes, you can develop a sponge-like, but you need them to kind of get going a bit quicker. That was a long-term investment that we went down the route of. But you can absolutely develop talent and you can develop it quickly, particularly in the line of sales. I think that often with sales, we view salespeople as this magical type of role that only a small number of people can do i, I just I don't, I don't i just don't buy into that yeah they've got a challenge though it, with a sponge style personality we seem to be and this is from personal experience you get a coach you're happy with a coach you find a coach that works yet you're always looking for more coaches and other coaches and different coaches and okay one person's given you one gem of information and suddenly you want to rip up the rule book and start again because this coach is the next big, best thing since sliced bread like how do you balance continuing to take on information, learn new information and stretching yourself versus knowing when to stick and invest in that individual and stick with that individual before just keep trying to roll the dice and try new things? Um, I appreciate we've gone a little bit away from our sales here, but uh, it's still applicable. Like again, with the sales process, okay, if we try and tie it back, what happens if someone's always trying to iterate the sales process and change it and tweak it and split test it and, make variations of it and trying to make it better and better and better yet actually they're not giving it enough time for version one to bed in to actually see if it works or doesn't work so it, it depends on it, it really depends on whether you actually buy into the solution that's that's being being provided so this links in with the, the first part of your question around changing coaches or changing where you're going as, as, as a person within a business or as, as a business owner it's being clear on saying, actually, do we believe the way we're going long term is going to get us to where we need to be? And, and often, particularly around development and personal development, this is what I, I, I personally have learned myself through my own development and that I coach on, is that sometimes there's a danger, again, going back to this transactional nature of the way that we live, is that we want results quickly. So we want change to happen really quickly. And as a result of that, we don't often invest the time in things that we need to. This applies in marketing, sales, all walks of life, right? that people don't give enough time to an opportunity to allow it to really work. So I think that you've got to have confidence in the individual that is coaching you or mentoring you or developing you as a leader. Let's apply this as a leadership perspective in sales. If you're working for someone, you've got to have the confidence that actually over a period of time, they're going to, they're going to get you to where you need to be. And that really comes down to past results and whether you buy into that individual. I mean, if you don't buy into the leader that you're working for, that's a, that's a real challenge. There's a misalignment there. You're not going to share the same vision of what you're doing. And certainly from a coaching perspective, I absolutely buy into the coaches that coach me that I believe value-wise they're going to help me get where I need to be. That, that gives me that confidence. I don't know if that fully answers your question, Nathan. But yeah. No, I think so. So pulling it back to sales, I mean, we've talked about the start of the process. We've talked about the target market. We've talked about nurturing them along the, the, the funnel. In terms of tools, and I'm just thinking practical-wise here, in the last kind of 10 minutes, if someone today has listened to what we've said, gone, yeah, I absolutely buy into that. I need to change my questioning style. I need to be, uh, what do they say, two of these, one of these, and I'm much more focused on listening and trying to not rush the sale. Where do people start? Where can someone start from tomorrow and say, you know what, we're going to get a sales process in place in this business. What do they need to do? by first of all defining how you deal with any inquiry coming in. So when a call comes in, email comes in, someone's interested, how you handle that. In fact, let's break that down a little bit further. We're talking about new opportunities, but also this applies to existing clients. When they make another inquiry or want a different type of product service from you, how you handle that. So when that inquiry comes through, what is it that you're going to say? What are the first words that come out of your mouth? And what are the first questions that you ask and the information that you give them that starts the sales process. The opening and the positioning statement is absolutely key to getting the sales process right. So even if you're 
Don't know at the point this, what questions you're going to ask. If you simply had a good opening statement, that is going to help you. And the questions that you then uh, that you then focus on have to be a mix about building rapport and trust by understanding a little bit about the individual. But then secondly, establishing what those needs are. Do you really understand, or let me rephrase that, does the customer understand or the prospect understand what they actually want? And in many instances, people come, as I said earlier, with a set of requirements that maybe they haven't got fully clear in their mind. Their mind. And I believe sales is about professionally helping others to buy. So if you're professionally you help someone to buy, you've got to help them identify what is it they're looking for. And then it's about saying, OK, can we offer that and can we provide that service? And often you are better to walk away from a sale from a service that you cannot provide than try and make it fit. Phil, it's interesting there because ethically you're spot on there. And many people have would have heard you say a couple of times today, you should walk away if it's not quite right. What do you say to those, let's go back to the estate agency example, the car sales where typically sales quotas are in place. What do you say to those people where actually, while they might want to work walk away ethically, they know that if they do, the, the, the next opportunity might not just be around the corner? Then that, that comes down to, confidence in your ability as a salesperson there's nothing worse than having a needy salesperson someone that got to hit a quota i say that if i'm buying a car the best time to go and buy a car is actually at the month end why because you know they've got a quota to fill and it's highly likely you're going to get a massive discount but that's that's a bad thing in a way when you think about it. a good thing from a buyer's perspective but i know that there's going to be the element of desperation potentially to gain the sale I think having the confidence to walk away from a deal is very empowering, but also sends a very strong signal out to a client. This applies too with pricing. You know, often we get so desperate on the deal that we become quite weak with negotiation. And there's a great communication specialist on this, great sales trainer, Andy Bounds. You know, he's written some great books on this. And I remember the example that he gave to me on a webinar, or I was on a, on a live coaching session not so long ago, was someone had... Um, said look can we get some discount and the uh, the, the prospect said the, the salesperson said yeah, absolutely we can do some discount let me just get my diary out and they got their diary out and started flicking through the pages and the, the prospect said why have you got your diary out well you've asked for a discount so what i want to do is put you in touch with our um, our b grade team that will be able to deal with your b grade service offering because you don't want an a grade service now i'm not saying do that right <laughs> well, <I love> it. <laughs> what a powerful point you know, absolutely, you can lower the price. Absolutely, you can reduce the quality. But that's the point. The, the, with the price becomes value. By lowering the price, we reduce the value. And, and often, again, we have to help prospects get this clarity around what is it they're looking for. Budgets are always flexible. I firmly believe that. Always flexible. It's getting the clarity around what they need and giving them the confidence that you can deliver what they need that's what moves away the discussion away from price. I, I went off a little bit of a tangent there, but hopefully it's relevant. So Phil, in the last seven minutes, what else would you say is important for people under, to understand when they're looking to unpick the secrets to a successful sales process? What else do you think people need to understand when going on that journey? So positioning, open statement we talked about, asking good questions, building the emotion and getting the need to change. Okay, so you need to change your website, Talk to me through about the urgency of that, why it's so urgent, what's the impact of that? So we establish really, okay, there's a desire to change, but why? what's the need to do it now? Um, and going back to one of the things that I said within this kind of call, call guide, as it were, I've put up on the flip chart, that close is about reaffirming what you did within the opening statement. So having confidence, if you get the positioning right, it's then having the confidence to close them. And when we went back over the, um, when we went through the uh, the sales process, this is another point I want to finish off on the highlight to everybody. Understand that at each stage of the process, there's a different area to close them on. Let me explain what I mean. When we've created awareness through marketing, it isn't about at that point trying to close the deal. At awareness stage, what we're trying to do is get them to have a conversation. When we get them to have a conversation, we want to get them to proposal stage. When we get them to proposal stage, 
Maybe we want them to review our, some of our testimonials or speak to some of our clients. So, Phil, just quickly there, there's like mini closes or, or micro closes, which essentially in awareness with marketing, all we're trying to do is get them on that first initial call or get them to. And then when we're in consideration, we're trying to get them from that first call to say, yes, they're prepared to receive a proposal or whatever that next trigger is going to be. And after that, we're just trying to get them to convert. And then in service, there'll be other little micro closes too. But we're not in awareness saying, buy this product is going to be amazing. This is how much it's going to cost, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And we probably all experienced that where someone's hanging over us with a contract, you know, where they're expecting us to close, do a deal, but actually we're not there yet. So we've got to understand where we're at within the sales process. So understanding where you're at in the sales process means the close will always be proportionate um, to where we're at and what the next stage is. Uh, you know, at what point can we ask for a referral? Well, was, maybe we can't ask them for a, a referral when they just buy from us. But once they become into loyalty, we can ask it. So know where you're at within the sales process would be the final thing. I'll just get everybody to think about that. Once you start laying, opening this up and thinking about what the steps we take our clients through, okay, well, what's the key parts within that that I need to close the client on? Or what's the next step that I need them to move to? What's the objective within this part of the sales process? You know, and, and do this on flip chart or, or paper or, or on to, for, from on app or whatever works for you. But simply drawing out and saying, right, so how do we create awareness? What are the stages, therefore, we take them through to get them into consideration? Okay, then once consideration, what are the steps to purchase? That very simply starts to iron out and get clarity around what the sales process is. Yeah, perfect. So a massive thank you for your time today. I hope those all have been listening have enjoyed today's session. I dare say Phil and I will be back for more action-packed fun on another session. But for now, if you do have absolutely any questions, Phil, how can people find you? How can people reach out and uh, ask you those further follow-up questions? LinkedIn's the best way. So I'll put a, a comment in with my LinkedIn profile, but you'll be able to pick me up from that anyway. Um, and if you want any of the, the, the slides that I've shown, because a couple I think I used earlier, but also I've got this as a PDF, you're welcome to have that if that's going to help you um, start building the sales process for your organization. Phil, a massive thank you today. Lovely to catch up as always. And I look forward to seeing you on the next session. Thanks to all see those you. that have watched and we'll see you next time. Many thanks.